Sarah Bodwe here from Horse Racing Nation with my special guest for today, Caitlin Free. Caitlin, for those that haven't been watching Churchill Downs, the track feed or anything from Turfway, do you want to introduce yourself really quick? Sure. My name is Caitlin Free. I am the paddock host and one of the analysts at uh, Churchill Downs. Um, I believe I'm the only analyst at Turfway right now, but I'm the paddock host there as well. And I do lots of podcasts. I do lots of videos. So kind of here, there and everywhere when it comes to Kentucky racing, but I enjoy international racing as well. So most people say I don't sleep because I'm so obsessed with horse racing, but I feel like Sarah can definitely relate to that too. Yeah, absolutely. There is never a moment of my waking and usually not uh, sleeping hours either where I'm not thinking about racing, dream about it. But speaking of Kentucky racing, you and I were there together and just really quickly to touch on the crazy upset of Ridge Strike. I mean, your face said it all in the past. <laughs> it was absolutely shocking. Well, I was, you know, I liked Epicenter, you like Zandon. Um, and we were both standing there together. We were just, you know, it was coming down to those two horses kind of like we thought it thought it would. And I thought that we read the race perfectly with everything that was going to happen, except for the horse that won. And I think it took me maybe the last 50 yards, I think he was already like neck and neck with Epicenter before I realized somebody else was there because I was so focused on him and Epicenter. And I was focused on the outside because, you know, the threat usually comes from way out wide instead of, you know, on the rail. So I think that really shocked me. And I think for the longest time, I didn't know who it was because I didn't want to believe it was Rich Strike. And suddenly Owen's leg was over top of the one. So with the similar saddle cloth colors to the two, I really thought it was Happy Jack for a while. And then I saw Eric Reed collapse. And I was like, oh, this just, just, doesn't, just doesn't make any sense. So that was um, shocking, to say the least. I mean, I feel like horse racing, you know, shocking things do happen. But I think that's the most shocked I've ever been, honestly. I think a lot of people would agree with that. And uh, the trainer, especially, we got to yeah. see him in complete disbelief and then the excitement that followed that they had managed to win the Kentucky Derby. But yeah. hopefully you and I can both pick some winners this coming Saturday night at Churchill Downs night racing, exciting stuff. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that you'll be there. So mm -hmm. we're going to go over the late pick five for Churchill Downs on Saturday, starting in race number seven, 9.05 p.m., my usual bedtime, but not this weekend. <laughs> Uh, we have allowance optional claimers. They're three-year-old fillies. We're going a mile and a 16th on the new turf course of Churchill Downs, which seems to have been well-received as of late. Who do you like in here? Oh, yeah, really well-received new turf course. Um, I heard it's very, very springy. The riders really like it. So I've heard great reviews on that. I've had a chance to talk to several of them. Uh, I, I thought this was a pretty tough race. You know, I thought there was a lot that could go in here, and I actually went four deep in this spot. Um, I don't really see, you know, a huge, you know, pace set up. I think there's, you know, a decent – actually, I lied to you. This was the wrong race I was thinking of. There's actually a lot of speed in this race. A um, couple, you know, two, three, maybe even four horses that I think would maybe kind of want to be forwardly placed. So I thought this could set up potentially for several horses that kind of come off the pace, maybe a few – um, of them, as I said, I went for deep in here. I took the one walkathon, the two red hot mama at a little bit of a price, the seven aerobatic, uh, by air gate doesn't really seems like it would translate well to the turf, but these connections, I just can't not use them. And then I took the eight Glenall, which I thought was probably the best horse in the race. But I think the other ones that I mentioned also get really good setups and do make some sense. What about you? Yeah, I agree with you on two of those. I really like the one walkathon. This horse tried the turf for the first time last time out and breaking her maiden and improved that buyer speed figure pretty significantly as well. And I, what I really liked about that race last time at Keeneland is that she broke very sharply and then was taken back off the pace and threw her head a little bit, but didn't resent it enough to the point of really compromising herself or really pushing the envelope. She then set off was a little bit wide and then seemed full of run in the stretch. So I like that she can break cleanly and get herself some position, but yep. she's going to have to do so coming out from the rail and three to one on the morning line, I think is a little bit generous in a way because you do have that Chad Brown horse trying to for the first time in the number seven that we know right. is going to take money yep. as well as the number eight horse Glenall. If you want a consistent horse, this is as consistent as it gets. She yep. ran a 76, a 77, and then a 78 buyer speed figure. And last time out, she was facing Spenderella, who a lot of people have been saying could be the next mean Mary. So I'll forgive kind of anybody that's been facing that horse for Grand Motion. 
coming in here, I don't think this group is as strong as that one. So she gets a little bit of class relief. And then I did look to a horse that's trying the turf for the first time. There are a couple doing that. But the one that I kind of was interested in was the number 10. I'm not going to try to pronounce this name because I feel like I'm going to butcher it. You might know this horse from Turfway. This is a mic maker, first time turfer, Ricardo Santana. Rosslitz. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm glad I didn't try to give that one a go. But maker 16% when moving synthetic to turf. So decent enough stats. Four out of five siblings to try the turf did win over the surface. Tur uh, Turfway shippers, we know, have been doing very well at Churchill Downs, including Rich Strike. So yeah. of the ones trying the surface for the first time, that's where I went. And I do agree that there, there's likely to be some speed in here. I think the six will go. I think the four will probably go. And I think even the 11 could probably go. So it might set up for these horses that are either sitting mid-pack or going to be closing. I might have to give Schlafmitz another look because she was one that I really, really did like a lot at Turfway Park. She was super consistent there, just didn't really quite fire in the Bourbon at Oaks. And I'm really not sure if it was, you know, just her not wanting to go that extra 16th of a mile because she was beaten by 11. But she also just kind of, you know, came up a bit short in that race. I think maybe she was just outclassed. But her two races before that were really, really impressive. And she's kind of just right there on these speed figures. I think she definitely will probably need to step up to beat these Phillies and Mares, but she's certainly not impossible. Blame on the turf. I'm just kind of like 50, 50 with that. But if I, you know, have room in my budget to throw another one in and maybe can shave off somewhere else, I definitely would throw Schloff mitts in. One thing that I do like about her is she's getting back on Lasix and both of her two wins, she's been on Lasix and she's been super impressive. So I certainly think she's in with a chance, you know, Mike Maker going from the synthetic or dirt to turf is usually a pretty good angle. So I would probably maybe throw her in there as well. I may have to relook at that. Like I said, I'm not super sold on the seven, the daughter of Airgate, but I know how Chad Brown is with the turf. I know how Tyler Cathleon is at um, Churchill Downs. So I'm like, Ugh, this one's stretching out. It's getting to the dirt for the, or the turf for the first time, excuse me. So it, I hate to say like, I want to eat the chalk on that one, but it almost scares me too much not to, if that makes sense. And the debut was pretty impressive, although it was on the dirt at a golf stream. Right, yeah, I I might be, running back a late pick four after not using the seven in there. But that's a, that's a risk I'm willing to take because at yeah. a short price, I just felt that there were others that had uh, either proven something over the surface or had the room to improve. And I know that that one is going to be eating money. So yeah, moving absolutely. along to, uh, right, moving along to race number eight. This is uh, Maiden Claimers in for the $50,000 tag. These are three-year-olds and up. Now we're going a mile on the dirt. This is a place where I decided to single and it's nothing super creative or um, – clever in here. I'm going to just single the six quick to blame. This one is dropping in for the tag for the first time from Maiden Special Weight Company. Normally, I wouldn't love a horse racking up seconds and thirds at a short price, but if you look back at the horses that have beat this one, we have Call Me Midnight, we have Call Me Jamal, we have Ethereal Road, we have Curly Tail. So facing tougher company, some horses that were in the conversation or actually entered into the derby, uh, Ethereal Road scratching out in there. So this is a much easier group. At least it looks this way on paper. And Brad Cox dropping from maiden special weight to maiden claiming, he's 37%. So when he drops them, they're usually well-intentioned. Mm -hmm. And this is a spot where normally I would love to look for a first-time starter at a price. But of the two first-time starters in here, the number nine horse uh, going after Chris Hartman, as good as Chris Hartman is, he is 0 for 8 debuting maiden claiming. Yeah. And then to the outside with One America, Al Stahl Jr. is 0 for 12, debuting horses going a mile or more. So there were just enough things to kind of just pick quick to blame and move along. What did you think? I'm kind of with you on that. The only other one that I think I would maybe include in here would be the seven, Uncle Burley. Certainly hasn't, you know, beaten as many type of or hasn't been beaten by as many type of good horses. All this, though this one did finish behind We the People and Major Contender was only beaten about a length and a half by Major Contender last time out. That was a maiden 62. So I think this one is also getting that drop down in class. Steve Asmussen's, uh, you know, racking up a little bit higher now on Churchill after kind of getting off the duck for a little while. Um, I'm a fan of these connections. And I think this is one to potentially look at, you know, dropping down in class. But I mean, other than those two, the only other one I would maybe give a nod to would be the three grapnel at a little bit of a price um ron hasn't had many starters yet at churchill yet this meet um this one's gonna need to step up but it does have tyler aboard and is dropping in class as well but i would probably stick with the six and maybe throw in the seven and i think that would probably cover you here in this race 
Right. And I looked at the three, two, this horse is stretching out for the first time as well. So the, there is some upside to like there, but I was like, you know, with Brad Cox's stats and the fact right. that this horse has been facing decent company, it's either spread and try to beat or just pick one and move yeah. along. So yeah, I'm, I'm like taking my stand. <laughs> Picking your spots. Yes, absolutely. Um, going into race number nine, this is the stakes race on the card, the Mamzelle overnight stakes, three-year-old fillies. Now we're sprinting on the turf going five furlongs. A likely heavy favorite in here with Twilight Gleaming. Are you all in or are you looking elsewhere? Um, I'm actually going to be all in on her. I actually singled her in this spot. Um, she's really done nothing wrong with Super Impressive at Ascot, with Super Impressive at Duville last year. Um, the only other than her debut at Keeneland, you know, on the dirt, or the only blemish on her record came last time out uh, to Slipstream in the uh, Palisade Stakes at Keeneland. And I just not sure she really likes Keeneland that much, although that was a really good score for her. I just think she stands out in this race. There is a little bit of other speed in here, but I think she's much faster. She was much faster than everybody in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint, which I don't think there's going to be any type of speed like that in here. Slipstream just kind of, you know, got the jump on her late. She set, you know, a quick enough pace, but there's really nothing in here that scares me with her. And I do like her dropping that extra half furlong back down to the five furlongs, which I do think is going to be her best distance when it's all said and done. I think that's what really hits her right, right between the eyes. That's what she really wants to do. Gets Tyler Gaffleone up. He's really good with turf riders, especially sprinters. And, you know, this is what Res Wesley Ward does. This is what she's meant to do. And I just really don't think there's anything that tough in here. Granted, you know, there may be a little bit of speed to go with her, but I really don't think they're as fast as she is in – you know, she gives a little bit of weight to some other ones, but I don't think there's a lot for a cause for concern in here. We don't talk about weight here. <laughs> we don't talk about weight. <laughs> no, um, some people think that it matters significantly in their handicapping, and I'm I'm not going to say that it, it matters not at all, but it's not a factor that I ever really consider yeah. in finalizing my selections. So... I agree with you for the most part. My only question is, shouldn't she have won last time? You know, she was she was a really short price and coming in off like Wesley's not exactly terrible off a layoff. He's no. very, very good at getting them ready to roll off of the bench. And so Slipstream, yeah, got to go right up the rail. But with the other potential speed in here, I think that that's going to come from number two, Mystic Eyes, who has yeah. hit the board in her every career start so far. She is making her three-year-old debut. I think that mo you would agree that most horses do take a step up when they go from two to three as they physically mature. You have those occasional, you know, two-year-old superstars that kind of don't go anywhere. But for the most part, horses do improve as they age and get older and more mature physically. So if she gets the jump on Twilight Gleaming as she is drawn inside of her, I think that she could be a little bit of a thorn in her side. The question I have about Mystic Eyes, you don't really see Ricardo Santana Jr. ride that often for Todd Fletcher. No. out of all of the riders that he usually goes to. So I'm kind of wondering what the idea is with that one. Um, and then for a little bit of a price that I like underneath, not necessarily as a win candidate at all, but the number four Boxing Day puts the blinkers on. Brendan Walsh, we saw him do this with Santine. We saw him do this with New Year's Eve. These yeah. are horses that were bigger prices that then went on to win. So whatever he's doing with these blinkers on, he's doing it successfully. It's 23% for him. This horse has progressively improving buyer speed figures. And maybe this is another one with that change that ends up causing a little bit of noise at the 15 to 1, although she's going to have to step up significantly to beat Twilight Gleaming. Yeah, I would definitely agree with you. Those are the three that really got my attention in this race. Mystic Guys definitely should step up. And I'm with you on the Ricardo Santana Jr. thing. I really don't know where that came from. I'm wondering if maybe some of his big money riders are out in New York right now because there is a huge New York card, you know, yes. this weekend at the same time. So I'm thinking that's got a lot to do with it. The only thing that kind of really worries me about her is, yes, it was on turf. I felt like she had everything her way in the matron. A couple starts back at Belmont. She got beat in a horse that I'm not really crazy about. Has done okay, but that's a horse in Bubble Rock. I've never just been a huge fan of her, and I really think Twilight Gleaming is better than Bubble Rock. Yes. But I think this one cutting back in distance, you know, could be the thorn in the side of Twilight Gleaming. And I would say if there's anybody, anybody in here that has a prayer of picking it up, it could be Boxing Day with the addition of the Blinkers, and she could be just sitting right off of those two. So I'd say if there was somebody to pick up the pieces, it would be her, but I, it's just tough for me to see Twilight Gleaming really getting beaten by any of these uh, fillies. 
Right. And I think that's a situation where you either take Twilight Gleaming and move on, or okay. you end up spreading significantly to beat her, and you might just be better off just taking the single and uh, right. moving forward. Absolutely. All right. Well, moving forward to race number 10, 10 42 p.m. These times keep getting later and later. Allowance <laughs> optional claiming company. Phillies and mares, three year olds and up. Now we're sprinting on the dirt, six and a half furlongs. In here, I think that that 10 to one morning line on jungle juice, I really wonder if that's going to hold. I, I feel like that might have been something that might have been an oversight or an error. I consider this to be a horse that's likely going to take play. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have to be the same horse that she was in the past to do well here. And she's yeah. faced some hard knocking uh, older female sprinters like Sconson, Bell's the one. Um, and she has done well off of a short turnaround before. So the fact that she just raced, and that was her first off the layoff uh, just on May 3rd at Indiana Grand and was second with a 65 fire speed figure. Now she gets a little bit more distance uh, and she gets that nice outside post as well for her running style. So at a price, if she stays anywhere near that price, that's definitely going to be my top pick in here. But then for other horses, uh, Liberty MD, she's a very lightly raced five-year-old. That's the number three with only five career starts. She's been in the money four out of five of them. And if you look in her running lines, she lost to Royal Flag. She sure. lost to Kamari. So some tougher horses that she was facing in the past as well. Uh, she ran well enough last time out of Keeneland that I would use her again against this yeah. group. So that's kind of where I went here. And then obviously the five Jerry B makes some sense as well. But her number, Kelsey Danner's numbers off the layoff aren't exactly anything to get super excited about. So right. I, would, I would maybe take a wait and see approach with that one. I think we pretty much agree. I don't think I like Jungle Juice quite as much as you do. Um, I really like the one in New Rue a decent bit, too. As we know, Turfway Park form can be pretty decent coming in here. She's got good form here at uh, Churchill Downs as well. And I like Corey Lannery on board her. I think he's a good fit for her. He's ridden her a couple of times. It's been a little bit a while. But she's got some really good black, uh, back class as well. Has been beaten by Finite. Lady Kate, uh, Matera, Ali Diva. Those are pretty good graded stakes caliber fillies or were at one point. A lot of them have retired. So I definitely want to maybe include her. Don't love the rail draw. Um, but I don't think that there's really a lot of speed in here. So I think she can maybe sit a decently close trip. And I think that's kind of what she wants to do. Best buyer career, career speed figure came here at Churchill Downs doing this so i really think she's one to consider in here i love liberty md in this spot i don't know what kind of price i'm gonna get on her probably a pretty short one but i think she's getting better and better and better and i think she fits in this race i also think the four remain anonymous is getting better and better too she's in career best form and i think she fits she could pot potentially be the speed in this race if there's not really anybody else that's wanting to go forward with that she kind of fits that uh turfway park form she was beaten by caravel a couple years ago so she's definitely you know, one of those top tier, like listed allowance race type of sprinters in the Kentucky area. So I think she makes sense. And I think the five jury B makes sense. I think this was a race that, you know, I'd maybe want to spread in because I don't see a ton of speed, but I also don't see no speed either. And I think there's, you know, maybe four or five Phillies and mares in this race that I think can win. Yes, this is a competitive group in that nobody really jumps off the page as an absolute superstar. Now, with the number one, does the fact that she's uh, the only one that's in for the tag bother you at all? Or is that not really a factor? No, I don't think it's really a factor. That used to be something that would kind of bother me a little bit. Um, it doesn't as much as it used to because I've seen horses at Turfway. I've seen horses at, uh, here do it. That it usually isn't really a factor. And a lot of times they're kind of hesitant to jump in for the tags, especially, you know, with them being as expensive as they are. So I would kind of take it with a grain of salt. I'm not quite sure she can necessarily win the race, maybe, especially with that rail draw. But I definitely want to have my basis covered with her because I do think she's in best form. And she does love Churchill. I like it. All right. Well, to close us out, back on the turf, this is race number 11, made in special weight for Phillies and Mares, three-year-olds and up. We're going a mile. I kind of chalked out in here. I went to the three beachfront bid for Chad Brown and Tyler Gaffleone. I do like the slight cutback for her to the flat mile. She's run competitively enough. And the horse that beat her last time, Lavish, Lavish Habits, uh, I really liked in that spot. She was a big price that day. She came back to run okay next time out. And then the number five, My Lily May. She has stretched out before at Turfway Park, but this is her first time stretching out on the turf. Uh, the short comment last out was herded. Um, so that 78 fire speed figure was a decent jump up enough that these were the two that I went to and nobody else beyond that really uh, stood, up, stood out on the page to me. What did you think? 
I took the three as well. I thought she was the most logical one in here. I'm actually waiting to see if the 13 will draw in because I like Treasure of War quite a bit as well at a little bit of a price. Not sure if she gets in. She is the 13, and that's a pretty wide draw. Takes the blinkers off. Uh, Daughter of Declaration of War, huge fan of him. Sharita Bow, huge fan of hers as well. Her barn is always really primed really ready to run, not a big stretch out in distance for her either. So I really do like her in this spot, taking off the blinkers. And when she didn't have the blinkers on in her main special weight debut, she was just beaten by five links to New Year's Eve, who we were talking about, who took well, well to this turf course as well. This is only going to be her third lifetime start. So wanted to give her a mention, but those would probably be the two for me. May want to give a little bit of a look to the 11, easy to love getting onto the turf after debuting on the dirt at Gulf Street Park, uh, daughter of empire maker out of an ap Andy mare that doesn't scream turf to me but i know there are good empire makers on the turf and bill mott likes the turf <laughs> so and with umberto rispoli on board on the turf i definitely thought you know maybe if the 13 doesn't draw in this would be one that i could you know sub in perhaps if i'm not comfortable singling the three and i looked at the first time starter in here and i was kind of 50 50 on it but these were the two i was going to lean to if the 13 doesn't draw in this one um the 11 easy to love also came out in main special weight that had wish you well inventing frip it in it those are pretty well um, accompanied Phillies as well. So I definitely thought there was a couple places to look in here, but I mean, really, I only saw two or three that uh, made a lot of sense to me in this spot. Right. I like your way of thinking. And I think we have all learned the hard lesson to always look at the also eligibles after uh, <laughs> what happened in the Derby. Always make sure you look at that last page. It was funny. There was somebody that I worked with at TVG would get so excited and then they'd always forget to turn over the page to look at the also eligibles. And that was going to like kind of be an undoing sometimes. So like, don't forget the also eligibles and take all in the Kentucky Derby. Those are my two biggest takeaways <laughs> from this weekend right uh anything can happen after what we saw this weekend I and i want to say everybody thought i was crazy for liking unoho but hey i mean unoho, <laughs> something unoho. even stranger so unoho looks like secretary on paper compared to rich strike <laughs> what, what do you think about rich strike uh skipping the preakness i've heard mixed reviews i mean breaking news that we just got today um, I was actually in the process of recording a podcast with someone. And once we saw it, I said, call me back because this is much more important to yeah. attend to this quickly. Um, I think it's, it's a good display of horsemanship if they really don't feel as though that spot is best for him or in his best interest. But I also wonder how much of that is really not believing that he would get the pace set up again to be yeah. benefited in the Preakness. They want to save him for the Belmont. Not as though closing from way far back has been extremely successful in the Belmont Stakes, but then there's extra added time to rest and recuperate in between, and he will likely – have more of a chance in there than I would think that he would in the Preakness. And then I think we still have a very exciting lineup for the Preakness with Secret Oath confirmed to go. Epicenter will likely be the favorite in there. Early voting is going to show some early speed. We get Unoho back. And who who knows who else could join that party within right. the next week or so. So Yeah, I, I'm totally with you on that. And honestly, it didn't really bother me. I think it's maybe a combination of both things. You know, wanting to take that extra time to rest. Not really sure he gets the same setup in the Preakness, which in my opinion, he doesn't. And I think that was going to be the most hard of the three for them to win. And really, you know, if you listen to any of the interviews with the owner or the trainer, the Preakness was never on their radar until right. they won the race and felt obligated like they had to go. And I was saying on Twitter earlier, you know, people were like, well, you have an obligation to go to the Preakness after you win the Derby. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. Everybody is upset saying, well, we need to do what's best for the horse. Oh, but except for the Kentucky Derby winner. They don't have to go to the Preakness. I think he is more cut out for the Belmont. Yes, closers don't typically do well in there, but I think he is a horse that is a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half horse. So I think even if they're not motoring, you know, he's going to be the one that sticks around for the mile and a half. So I think he can hit the board in that race. And I think he would have been overmatched in the Preakness, you know, based on the short distance and based on the pace setup. Cause I mean, really it's going to be early voting and it's going to be epicenter. And I think they're going to probably try to go pretty slow. So I, I just didn't see it for him in the Preakness. And I mean, I'm sure that Derby effort did take a decent bit out of him. So why push him to the Preakness? You know, when Eric Reed's never had a horse at Pimlico, Sonny Leone's never rode at Pimlico. So what did they really, other than maybe having another outsider's chance to do something that would totally buck the horse's form? And like every way that he's ran prior, if they had an outside chance to do that, which I don't think that race falls apart like the Derby. I mean, what's the point of really even going? 
Exactly. And I think maybe if it looked like he was going to get a similar setup and they passed, I would be a little m bit more um, frustrated by that for yeah. them in wanting to see the potential of a triple crown horse or um, that story going forward into the Belmont. But I think that they understand how the race would set up. I think that they understand that they can save their horse for the future. And I think that really, ultimately, they're making the call that works best for them. And we can all speculate on everything else. But at the end of the day, I'd rather see them be more cautious than really push it. So, yeah, exactly. Really you just came out of a career best effort that was probably pretty tough on him. So, I mean, I I like the call, actually. And people are like, well, that just means we should space out the Preakness, the Belmont, the Derby, and make them a month to part. We've had that conversation yeah. before, though, and it doesn't happen. There's a reason why it's as difficult as it is to do it. Yeah, and I mean, there's horses that come out of the Derby that do go to the Preakness. I just don't. There's a couple coming out that will go. I'm not surprised Epicenter went. I'm a little surprised Andon's not going. Um, I don't like him as much for the Belmont as I would maybe like him here because I don't think he wants to go a mile and a half. But I guess my whole thing was, you know, as improbable as Rich Strike was to win the Kentucky Derby, is he really a legitimate triple crown threat? And I think the answer to me is no. So I don't know why people are so upset about him not going when, you know, the owners and the trainer are doing what is best for the horse. And ultimately, at the end of the day, that's that's really what everybody wants, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think really it just comes down to FOMO. You know, if he won the yeah. Belmont, it would be like, what if? But if they're making the right call, all we can do is support them. And at least Absolutely. they're being cautious with it. So. Thank you so much for joining me. I know that this is our first time talking on camera, but we've had a great time talking off camera and getting to know oh, each other. Yeah. Caitlin is one of the best. It's so nice to see other young women that have a clue of what they're doing and really take their space in a career in the thoroughbred racing industry. And it gives me more people to look up to and to be like, yes, I belong here. So thank you for all that you do. Everybody can catch you at Churchill Downs and you do a fantastic job. Well, ditto, ditto to you, of course. You know, I feel the exact same way about you. So, and hopefully seeing more of you at Churchill Downs because you're pretty good there as well. And I feel like <laughs> the ticket that we constructed um, going into the Derby, bummer. But I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I would have been way more crushed if I sat there and preached all day to take every horse in the Derby. And then I sat there and looked at you and I was like, okay, but we can easily toss these three horses. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I mean, things happen, but. Yep. Next time. Yes, absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, you can tune in to more of Caitlin on the Churchill Downs track feed. You can see her. I'm assuming you'll be at Turfway next year when they open yeah. up and all that. And then you can find Caitlin on Twitter at Caitlin E. Free as well. I'm sure we will be chatting again in the near future. But thank you so much for your time. Of course.